Welcome to Scanner School, session number 23. Today we are talking about general aviation monitoring with Dave Pascoe from LiveATC.net. If you've never listened to any aviation monitoring, let's uh, take a quick listen to some ground traffic at Republic Airport before we kick off the show. 248, you're cleared for Republic Airport to Dulles Airport via the Farmingdale 5 departure. Radar vectors uh, Kennedy has filed, maintain 3,000 on departure, set 6,010. Departure frequency will be 125.7. Buck 2643, you are released for departure. Avoid not off in 10 minutes. There's traffic on short final for runway 19. Welcome to the Scanner School, a podcast dedicated to the scanner radio hobby. Class is about to begin. Here is your host, Phil Lichtenberger. So welcome to Scanner School, a podcast where we teach you everything that you need to know about the scanner radio hobby. My name is Phil Lichtenberger, and my amateur radio call sign is W2LE. Today, we are talking about aviation monitoring. This is part two of our aviation series. Last week, we had talked about air shows, one of my favorite things to do. And that's kind of how I met Dave Pascoe, KM3T, who is the owner of LiveATC.net. Back in 2005, I started my own website, W2LIE.net, where I would stream the local scanner traffic. Well, Dave started kind of the same thing back in 2002. He wanted to listen to his local airport, just out of reach of his scanner. He he just really couldn't hear it well enough. So he set up a live feed in Boston so that he can listen to the Boston airport from his home computer. That's kind of how Dave got his start. A couple years ahead of me, but, you know, kind of doing the same thing here. Well, I started streaming the air show from Jones Beach at a Long Island, New York. And uh, Dave had asked, reached out to me and basically said, hey, can I relay your stream to my audience at liveatc.net? Sure thing. It's all about getting the information out there, right, guys? So here I am. I'm serving the live feeds to my audience. Dave wants to do the same thing. And, you know, it's that's what it's there for, right? It's it's there to I'm, – I'm here to help people. Dave's here to help people. Uh, we all want to share the information, the knowledge, everything that we know. Um, and if there's one way that you know we can do it and teaming up and helping each other, that's that's what we do. So um, you know, this past year as well, unfortunately, we had a rain out this year on the second day of the air show. But you know, again, I teamed up with Dave, and uh, we were streaming the air show on my own personal site as well as on LiveATC.net and all of his properties. But uh, Dave and I. You know, we've we've uh, been in touch throughout the years. Dave's a really great guy. Um, like I said, he's uh, he's also a ham KM three T, but he's also a licensed pilot. So he has a really strong knowledge of aviation monitoring, which is why I asked him to be a part of the Scanner School podcast today. So for those of you who aren't or really in on what LiveATC.net is, it's a website that streams got about well over two thousand live feeds from across the globe just dedicated to aviation monitoring, tower frequencies, uh, ground, clearance. It's kind of one of these, you name it, he feeds it. So that's why I brought Dave on. You know, Dave Dave knows his stuff, and I figured there's nobody better to teach about aviation monitoring than Dave Pasco. So, so with that aside, let's bring Dave on, and uh, we'll see you on the other side of the interview. Dave, thank you so much for being here. Hey, thanks for having me, Phil. So, uh, Dave, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, um, I am, uh, as Phil mentioned, my uh, ham radio call sign is uh, KM3T. I'm the uh, founder and the owner of LiveATC.net. Uh, I've been a, a ham radio, a scanner, and communication buff, kind of like Phil, for many years, ever since my uh, teenage years. And um, my background, my professional background is in electrical engineering and uh, many aspects of information technology. Okay, very good. So uh, what do you think that a user would need uh, or own if they want to get into aviation scanning? The most important thing, uh, Phil, is uh, an antenna, preferably mounted outside and in the clear. Uh, Indoor antennas can work. Uh, They just don't work quite as well. And we'll we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through this. Um, And then they just need a scanner or uh, an SDR, uh, software defined radio, either one of those two things. Um, the SDR is, is arguably the most inexpensive uh, way to get into it. So for 20 or $25, they could basically have an aviation receiver. Um, 
so those are the two things. The antenna, I, I can't stress the antenna enough only because in the aviation frequency band and because all of the transmissions use amplitude modulation or AM, there's much more susceptibility to noise, say, compared to police scanning uh, like VHF, FM, or, or you know UHF, or trunked radio frequencies, which are much higher frequencies. But AM modulation is much more susceptible to power line noise and other things like that that tend to make it harder to pick up the signals. Uh, it's easy to pick up the airplanes, uh, but much harder to pick up the air traffic controllers. Right. So do you need anything like special besides the antenna? You said a radio that, that does AM. Do you need a top of the line uh, radio for this or can you pick something up that's maybe a little bit budget friendly? Yeah, something that's just easy where you could just, you know, get the box and press buttons or a regular scanner. They are available used on eBay and other sources, flea markets. Uh, if you hunt around, I mean, you can get a scanner for literally as cheap as 25 or $30. Uh, but very commonly, you could find them for an average cost of maybe you know fifty dollars or so on eBay, and a any scanner that actually covers the aviation band, which is one eighteen to one thirty six megahertz, that's the the civilian aviation band. Any scanner that covers that frequency range will be fine. Uh, most of the receivers that have been made, even you know going back to the seventies and eighties, all the receivers are very similar, and they're all very capable they all have about the same sensitivity and uh they'll do you just fine right and that's a really great point because that means you can actually go in the closet and dust off the old ra uh, ra the old radio that absolutely uh, you haven't that's, used. that's I mean, that's one of the things that that they're really good for because you know as, as you've i think covered and, and will cover in a lot of your episodes scanning has gotten much more complicated with trunked radio and and you know digital scanning and things like that. Those are far more complicated. Aviation scanning is really easy to get into. And it's really fun too. So It is. Yeah. So do you need to live near an airport in order to get involved in aviation scanning? Well, if you're near an airport, it helps a lot because the closer you are to a signal, the stronger the signal is going to be. So it's going to be easier to hear the conversations. Um, so if you're near an airport, that'll help, especially if you're the focus of, the, of your monitoring is that particular airport. Um, otherwise, it sort of depends on what kind of personal monitoring interest you develop. Like, you know, some people are interested in their local airport, but there's a whole bunch of people out there who are interested primarily in what we call in route communications. These are higher altitude uh, traveling airplanes, like mostly commercial airliners that are traveling above, say, 18,000 feet. Uh, and that can be really fun too. It can be really kind of, you know, boring and routine also, but a lot of times when interesting things, let's say, happen in route, uh, those conversations are going to be the ones that have the, you know, like an airplane declaring an emergency or, or something like that. Uh, you'll tend to hear that on the in route frequencies first uh, a lot of the times. Right. And how far do you think that a typical with an outdoor antenna, like you were stressing earlier, how far do you think that you'd be able to hear with, um, you know, the in route frequencies? So if you have an antenna outside on in route, uh, you can hear, you know, fairly easily out to uh, out to 100 miles uh, without any issues, uh, depending on your location. You know, if you're on high ground and you have you're much higher than the average terrain uh, around you, uh, you can hear out to probably, you know, a good 150 miles, uh, and if you don't have any other sources of interference like power line noise and things like that, that ca they can tend to mask the signals or make them weaker. Right. That's that's uh, one of those things to remember, too. It's line of sight. So an airplane is really high up in the air, right? And it is line of sight to your antenna. So uh, the mileage does vary. But yeah, the will... mi the mileage does it definitely does vary. And, and it's, it's sort of it's mostly line of sight because it's in a lower part of the VHF spectrum. Um, it's, it's mostly, it's not strictly line of sight. In other words, you can hear a little bit beyond uh, the horizon, but you've got to be in a high, you know, kind of a quiet location, but it's, you know, primarily line of sight. You don't have to literally see the airplane, but if you drew a line, uh, you know, from your location, from your antenna location out to the horizon, you'll be able to see, you know, if you sort of had a, a 3d map, a 3d picture, 
uh, it, it's it's that kind of line of sight, line of radio sight. Right, right. And now, um, I mean, another thing that we were talking about too was there's different aspects of the monitoring of aviation. So I know, I know a lot of people they like to go to the local airport and just sit there, you know, outside the airport and listen to the ground clearance or just a local tower. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have a really small aircraft, uh, really small airport over here that uh, that's really good for doing that too because it's just you get the Sunday flyers out there and uh, just to sit out there too on a quiet day and listen to the aviation is uh, it's a really good way of passing the time so mm -hmm. it's it's really good um so what else can you expect to hear on the aviation band besides listening to you said before like a unit declaring an emergency or what we just uh talked about you know sitting next to an airport and listen to the, the ground or or the tower operations what else can somebody expect to hear when they're listening to aviation so you could hear everything from routine routing and directing of uh, airliners uh, at the higher altitudes uh, all the way down to uh, air traffic controllers communicating with say student pilots at the local airport somebody uh, who's over there uh, doing their first solo flight um, you can hear uh, some of the local smaller airports that don't have control towers have a frequency called the CTAF the CTAF that's the stands for common traffic advisory frequency and at these non-towered airports that is a frequency where uh, pilots will get on and they'll self-announce where they are what their intentions are uh, you know they'll say like Cessna November one two three four five uh, I'm entering a left downwind for runway three two and then they'll say the airport name so you you can listen to those frequencies and those tend to be you know somewhat interesting because it's it's not you know, professional pilots, and, and sometimes it's, it can be entertaining. Uh, you'll hear helicopters. Um, you know, New York City's great. Uh, big metro areas like that, you know, you hear helicopters talking to each other, staying out of each other's way uh, in the course of their duties. Uh, there's just a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I find it interesting to listen to a, a variety of things. Uh, some of the things I like, uh, which is another thing, is the radar controllers in very busy uh, airspace, uh, like any of the metro areas uh, around the world, uh, the radar controllers, especially the ones that are running what we call the uh, the final approach frequency at a big airport. You know, JFK is one of our most popular airports close to you. Um, that's one that you know I could I could just listen all day to those controllers directing the airplanes. You could hear the air traffic controller basically lining all these airplanes up, and then they have to have you know a certain amount of separation between them. And uh, by the way, that's air traffic control's number one job. It's not talking on the radio. It's talking on the radio in order to accomplish keeping all those aircraft from running into each other. So keeping aircraft separated is uh, ATC job number one. And uh, so it's all, it's all interesting. There's so much different stuff going on. And, and a lot of it really depends on where you live uh, as to what's available, you know, within that sort of line of sight range. Right. I mean, you talk about lining up all the airplanes at JFK and, and you know, at certain times of the day, that flight path is right over my house. So yeah. <laughs> we sit here and we can actually, I mean, they're not that low on approach with the, with the landing years down, but they're, they're low enough to kind of start reading uh, what's on the tail or on the side of the airplane without needing any type of, uh, you know, binoculars or something like that. So um, it's, it's, it is interesting to hear them come in and, and line up and everything like that too, even from uh, miles out because I'm, about 35 minutes away, you know, as, as the crow flies to JFK. So I'm not on top of the airport, but I'm still far enough away where um, the planes do go overhead on their final approaches. So it's, it's cool yeah. to listen to that as well. And, it, and, and, you know, even, you know, we're, we're talking about and focusing on the listening part, but you, you mentioned the airplanes uh, going overhead. You know, one, for me, one of the coolest things is uh, to be just looking up at night. Uh, and if you're in the right spot uh, near an airport, just looking out, past the runway, the extended runway, into the distance, and you, you look at those airplane uh, landing lights, right? And you can just see them all lined up. I mean, it's a pretty picture just to see. But if you think about that, you know, there's a way that they get all lined up like that. It doesn't happen by magic. And it's that cooperation and that communication that occurs between pilots and air traffic controllers in order to make that all those little separated uh, sets of lights the right distance from each other. It's really neat. Right. And it always goes in the old saying too, right? What makes a great communicator is somebody who can listen. <laughs> so the pilots are really great communicators. So Exactly. 
Exactly. Uh, Here's some funny things happen too. I mean, there, there, there are some who are better than others at communicating, but, uh, you know, pretty much all across the board. I mean, it's a, uh, it's a very uh, amazing thing to listen to, uh, because it's, it's a finely, uh, tuned machine. You had mentioned a couple things earlier about like CTAF and uh, left downwind, but what are some of the key terms maybe that if somebody's listening to aviation for the first time or, or is getting into it, what are some of the, the terms that they may need to know or need to pick up on right away so they kind of understand what's going on when they're listening to the scanner? So a few of the things, or m- many of the things that you're going to hear on the aviation bands are, are aircraft that are in a variety of you know, states of uh, departing an airport or arriving at an airport. So some of the terminology that you'll hear uh, at, let's say, tower, which is one of the most commonly listened to positions, uh, you'll hear, you know, November some such and such line up and wait. And that means the aircraft can now go out to the runway and get ready to take off. They basically line up, you know, on the runway, but they're not cleared yet. Cleared for takeoff. Uh, everybody kind of knows that one or has heard it, and that's exactly what it sounds like. The, the tower controller is now given that aircraft uh, permission to take off on the runway. Cleared to land, uh, just the opposite. They're cleared to land on a runway. Uh, you'll hear the radar controllers uh, telling an aircraft, you know, turn left, heading uh, 080. That means turn to the left and you're going to turn to a uh, magnetic heading of uh, 080, uh, 80 degrees, um, and so forth. Um, squawk code is another one. You'll hear uh, an aircraft call up air traffic control and the air traffic controller will come back and say, uh, November 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, squawk 5416. So that's a, a four digit code. It's called a transponder code. Every aircraft has to have um, a transponder, which is a beacon that tells or shows uh, the air traffic controller where that aircraft is so that it's a little dot on the radar screen. So the squawk code gets assigned by ATC to uniquely identify that aircraft for radar tracking purposes. And that's really critical. It's the number one job when an aircraft calls in. That air traffic controller must get positive uh, radar identification and there are special rules that they have to follow observing that squawk code being sent by the airplane, uh, that 5416, uh, which is one example code. Um, uh, The air traffic controller has to be able to observe that or a variety of other things. Sometimes tower coordinates with uh, the radar controller to let them know that an aircraft has just departed. That's another positive way of identifying the aircraft. So those are some of the, some of the phrases Um, entering the left downwind, the one that I mentioned earlier, that's at, Typically, at, an, at a non-controlled airport, a pilot will be announcing that. And the downwind, if you look at the uh, aircraft pattern, it's probably easiest just to Google, you know, aircraft uh, or airport pattern or traffic pattern, uh, and you can you can sort of read what that is. But there's sort of downwind, then you turn base, which is the turn you make right before you turn uh, on final approach to the runway. And then you say November 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, turning final runway 32, and then the airport name. So, you know, you'll hear these things. I know when I first started listening uh, a long time ago, I didn't know what they were talking about. I mean, they might as well have been speaking a language that I never heard before uh, because I hadn't. And it was something that was kind of really confusing (laughs) uh, for a while. You know, I would hear these terms and they were talking so fast that I found it really challenging to, to keep up. And then later, you know, when I got more used to it and understood it, then it became much more interesting because now I could sort of, you know, piece all the things together. But um, it's, it's very interesting and you learn it pretty, you'll learn it pretty quickly if you listen enough. Yeah, so that's funny you said too about them talking fast because I'm not an everyday listener of aviation or, or the, you know, the aviation band. So when I do go back and tune to it, it sounds like they're talking a mile a minute. Mm-hmm. And it's like, how do you pick apart the conversation, but it's with anything else. You get used to it, you get the rhythm of it, and then eventually you start, you're able to then pick apart. Because they they do it as a, um, it's a set set of commands, I guess, right? So it is, yeah, it's very, it's what we call standard phraseology and and every, everything, all these phrases, they're all supposed to be, you know, used exactly as they were intended and and what, what the guidelines sort of say. 
and what what flight instructors teach and what you know people who train air traffic controllers teach and the air traffic controllers actually have a a bible essentially it's the uh, 7110.65 which is uh all the rules that govern air traffic control at least in the united states and every country has their own set of rules and and but the, the procedures themselves are very similar you know there's a lot of uh, universal things in air traffic control that are very much the same because when pilots you know take jets all around the world they have to be uh, knowledgeable and, and there's got to be some common language uh, that they speak and so um, a lot of that's been standardized right so it makes it easier on a listener once you get used to the rhythm and you know what's coming next then you're starting to able to anticipate okay the next can be a squat code the next will be the the frequency or you know this that the other thing so you get you get yeah. kind of used to it by listening to it uh, you what's, what's going to yeah. come next so you it, do and then and and in different countries um you'll find that there's there's a little there's sometimes a slightly different twist uh you know something that uh, we say here might be said just slightly differently there. Uh, but when you listen, you sort of get it just through the context of the conversation. You'll, uh, you'll say, Oh, you know, that's cause you know, the, the rhythm and the flow of what's going on, you know, depending on what kind of position you're listening to, whether it be tower or any of the other ATC positions. Right. So you talked about that just now, like tower ground, uh, ATC, uh, we talked about clearance. So obviously they don't all, talk in the same frequency because it would just be chaotic at that point mm -hmm. what would be the typical i mean you as a pilot what's a typical workflow or flow chart that you go through when you're on the radio and just getting ready to to start up the airplane um what's the typical path radio path that you start going through so the the sequence is, is this and i'll use a towered airport because that's uh, the most complex when you're at an, a non-towered airport by yourself just flying out it's it's a little bit uh, different and a little more solitary. Uh, but at, at a towered airport, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to tune in the, uh, the ATIS, the uh, ATIS, which is the information that's constantly broadcasting on a given frequency. And it's got weather, it's got uh, what runway uh, is in use. So the, the ground controller, the, the ground end tower controller, that position, the control tower basically records that every hour and they have you know the barometric pressure uh, the winds what runways in use as i said and so and then they also give you a code that you have to copy down so uh the code will be you know information it starts off in the morning with information alpha then bravo then charlie abc and down the line so it'll say information bravo you know runway three two in use and, and it goes on and on but you have to write down that letter that alpha or bravo and then when you uh, call up, let's say you're an IFR flight uh, where we have to get a clearance, the first position we'll contact is clearance delivery. So that's a distinct frequency. We'll talk to the clearance delivery controller and say, you know, this is November 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I've got information. Bravo. I'm ready to copy my IFR uh, clearance to uh, Republic, uh, whatever, wherever you're going, whatever the airport name is. And... Um, they will read back the clearance. You'll read it back to them to confirm that you copied it okay. And then they say, you know, have a nice day. So the next thing you do is you need to now taxi your aircraft because you're sitting in front of the FBO uh, or, you know, in your parking spot somewhere. So you call ground and you say, you know, ground, November 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I am uh, ready to taxi with information. Bravo. You have to give them that code again. Uh, and then they give you taxi instructions and you'll go to the area right before, uh, the runway takeoff position. And, you know, you'll run up your engine or you may have done that on the ramp. The next frequency after that is when you're ready to depart. So you go, we've, we've already gone through clearance ground and now we go to tower. So we're ready to take off and, uh, we contact them and they, we just then either wait or they're ready for us and. Uh, tower gives us a cleared for takeoff instruction. After that, um, then we're off to uh, position a radar position called departure. Uh, approach and departure are, are typically combined in a facility, uh, which can be in the tower at certain airports, uh, but it can also be what's called a TRACON, uh, which stands for uh, Terminal Radar Approach Control. 
And a trade con is typically like a building that's completely separate from an airport. It's it's out somewhere, and uh, they have remote uh, transmitters that are typically near airports or in high locations that. Uh, give them the radio coverage uh, that they need to communicate with aircraft. So departure will handle us, and typically for a general aviation aircraft that's going to you know, typically be below, uh, say, 15,000 feet, you'll you'll stay with them. You know, the aircraft. I'll be as a pilot. I'll be talking to them for a while. Uh, however, if uh, if uh, I'm flying a uh, more capable aircraft or a commercial jet. Uh, or as a commercial flight, the next position that they'll go to is what's called center. Uh, this is what we were referring to earlier about uh, when we called it en route control. Um, center in the U.S. anyway, they're called air route traffic control centers, ARTCCs. Uh, and there's about, uh, I don't remember the exact number, there's, there's a dozen of them that, that cover the continental United States and uh, they handle flights um, typically above 18,000 feet. But depending on the part of the country you're in, there may be no TRACONs because there may be no, uh, you know, populated areas that like a big city or something. So when there's no TRACON, then the centers have sometimes pretty large uh, areas that they cover. And for monitors, uh, for aviation scanner monitors, this can be uh, another interesting thing to listen to because there's uh, transmitters all over the place. They, they transmit from, in any given center, they'll have at least a couple of dozen locations where they have you know, pretty big transmitter sites and a lot of frequencies at some of them. Some of them have up to seven or eight frequencies that they talk on. Uh, and those tend to be at pretty good radio locations, you know, either high up or, or out you know, on decent high ground so that you know, their line of sight is really good from those transmitter receiver sites to the aircraft. Uh, so even if you're not near an airport, that's another uh, position that is uh, really ripe for, you know, seeing if there's one near you. Excellent. So we talked about a lot about what a user can listen to if they have their own radio. But if they don't have their own radio that's capable of pickup aviation, or maybe they're in a basement apartment and they can't do an external antenna, you've got a good solution for anybody who wants to or maybe somebody who wants to listen to another airport that's outside of their listening area. Um, tell us a little bit about liveatc.net. Sure. So liveatc.net is, uh, in essence, it's a worldwide network of uh, aircraft band uh, listening posts, you know, scanners and, and other receiving uh, apparatus. And I uh, started it back in uh, 2002, uh, really out of a out of a need for listening outside my local area that I had for myself. So it wasn't really started to, to be this worldwide thing. It, it really was started to listen to an aircraft, or sorry, uh, an airport that was 50 miles away. I specifically, uh, I was doing my pilot training and I was moving on to my uh, instrument uh, training. And I wanted to listen to Boston approach in this case. So uh, I was just outside the range. I was out at, you know, 50 miles from Boston and not line of sight to the airport. And so I couldn't hear, I could only hear one side of the conversations and I was trying to learn the lingo. And uh, so I was able to put a receiver within a few miles of the airport at my brother's house. And uh, I was also involved in a, a virtual air traffic community online. And uh, I thought, you know, we're all, we were the Boston group. So I thought it'd be great if uh, those folks could listen. So I put it online and that's how live ATC really got started. Excellent. It always starts small, right? Then all of a sudden it grows. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Sometimes, and sometimes, you know, things just start out as a, as a hobby or, or something that you're, you're interested in and interested in pursuing in a, in a way that's you know hopefully useful to other people. Exactly. So what exactly besides Boston, what can you hear on live ATC? So right now, uh, we've got around uh, 2,200 live feeds uh, at any given time. We, we kind of hover around that average, and we've got another uh, 300 or so. So call it about you know 2,500 in the catalog. The 300 are always in some kind of a state of flux. Uh, you know, We might have people who host a receiver, but they're in the process of, uh, of moving, or uh, we have equipment down somewhere, and, and it might be pretty far away and hard to, hard to fix easily. So sometimes, you know, when you have that many channels or feeds, uh, you know, 
something's going to be down all the time. <laughs> right. uh, we've got about 1,200, roughly 1,200 airports in uh, 90 countries. Wow, that's impressive. And then a lot of that in route as well that we talked about that the, the center ARTCCs in some countries they call them FIRs. Uh, but we have a lot of that because there's a, a fair amount of interest in that as well. Right. And, and the other thing, too, is you have all these airports, but you also have, like we talked about before, right, the clearance, the ground, the tower, the uh, yeah. approach departure, all for those those airports as well. Yeah, and some airports, they're combined up. Like we talked about the different positions, clearance and ground sometimes. Sometimes there is no clearance, but instead ground will provide the clearances and provide uh, taxi instructions on the ground. Uh, but we tend to try to divide them up as much as we can uh, and have and offer separate channels for people to listen to so they're not all combined. When we started out, we, we were literally using scanners I mean, and scanning between different channels uh, and, or frequencies. And so when, when you do that, you know, as, as scanner listeners or users uh, have come to know, uh, you know, you're always giving something up. Uh, you can use priority channel feature and things like that, but you're always going to be giving something up because if it's busy, there's always going to be some communication blocking another one and you can't listen at the same time. So we've tried to, through the use of multiple scanners and through the use of, uh, and the magic of uh, software defined radios, we've tried to divide that up so that uh, we're covering as much as we can uh, at a given location. Right. Yeah, those uh, SDRs are a real lifesaver and, and for anybody who's listening, that there will be a little bit of a SDR uh, episode coming up in the future, but we don't have one yet to tell you what day is going to run. But we we have that in the in the uh, in the plan as well. A lot of a lot of interest in SDRs, Dave. Everybody wants to know about them. <laughs> yeah, I think all you listeners should really tune into that episode because I'm sure Phil do a great job and. Uh, or you know whoever presents it, it's it's really uh, the least expensive way to get exploring quickly, and and it gives you some tools that you know we just never had uh, yep. when Phil and I were growing up. Uh, you can visualize uh, signals and the whole sort of frequency spectrum and 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 quickly tune around. I mean, you know, we started out with uh, crystal controlled scanners and tunable radios and things that were much less uh, capable than what what's out there today. It's, it's just, and it's amazing, especially if you consider, you know, you're doing this with a computer that you already have and a little SDR that costs you maybe $20. Uh, if you, if you do that in, you know, inflation adjusted dollars, right, that's $20 in 2018 dollars. Uh, there's no better value than that for, no. for getting your feet wet. Not at all. And, and, the, and the, just the fact that knows that we have a waterfall to look at now where you can look at an entire spectrum you know, at a blink of an eye where it used to be, you know, you'd be lucky if you hit it with the search mode. So yeah. especially when it comes down to aviation scanning, it's really nice to be able to look at, you know, a chunk of uh, the band at once. And then you can see there's activity on it. You can, you can quickly move over to it. But again, we'll we'll talk about that um, on another episode unless, unless Dave, you have something else to add to the SDRs that uh, would enhance somebody listening to uh, to aviation. Well, the only the only other thing I could say about the SDRs is that, uh, and I know you're gonna you're gonna have a separate episode, I believe, on um, military band scanning or you know listening to the military aviation frequencies. I know that uh, a lot of the the folks who are really heavily into that uh, use the SDRs because the transmissions uh, from the fighter pilots and stuff like that uh, tend to be very fast radio transmissions, very brief. And, uh, so it's harder to, you know, pick them up on a scan. And I know people that have, you know, like a dozen scanners covering that whole frequency range, but they also have SDRs that look at some of the key frequencies so they can just see the little blip on the, uh, on the screen or on the waterfall display. And, uh, so a lot of uses for the, uh, the SDRs and on a whole bunch of different frequencies. Yep. And that's, that's a key thing too, that, that you just brought up too, is, is aviation in the middle air it's very, very brief, and they are very quick about what they say. And sometimes you got to sit there and go, what? <laughs> so. Yeah, you can go hours. I mean, you know, some of the airports, uh, we talked about the, the non-controlled or non-towered airports and then the busier metro airports. And then there's some that are kind of in between. But sometimes, you know, you'll tune into a channel and, you know, like, uh, is this thing working? Because uh, you can go literally at a, at a small airport. Like, you'll go an hour, and there may be no radio transmission. Or you may have a frequency that's completely congested because, you know, two or three student pilots are 
you know, training flights start decided to go out or whatever. So it, it really varies uh, by time of day, by time of year. Uh, there's a lot of variables, but you just have to, you know, keep trying. Exactly, exactly. So uh, going back to live ATC, if somebody wanted to help you out and, and set up a live feed for their local airport, what would be the process that uh, they would go through? So uh, the first thing is to to be helpful. It's useful to be less than, say, eight or ten miles from the airport, the nearest airport, uh, unless you're on, you know, high ground, you're, you're much higher, like on a hill relative to where the airport is that and you can maybe go a little bit longer, you know, maybe even out to 12 to 15 miles. Um, it's helpful if you have some radio equipment uh, or you're willing to host some small electronics that will be used for reception. Uh, we have a variety of technical solutions that uh, we can uh, provide uh, and be able to mount an antenna outside or in an attic, preferably. Um, anything other than those two locations would probably not work very well. And then the other thing is to have uh, internet you don't need very much bandwidth. We use very low bit rate streaming because it's just voice. We're not streaming music. So uh, you don't need a lot of uh, bandwidth or a fancy internet connection. Um, a lot of people sometimes, you know, c contact us and they say, well, you know, I've got fiber to the house and uh, gigabit ether, you know, gigabit internet. And I, <laughs> we're, we're only using, you know, eight to eight to maybe 20 kilobits per second of bandwidth. So What's most important, as I mentioned earlier, is the antenna and the ability to receive the signals. And uh, so if you meet those requirements, um, best thing to do is just you know, go to the website, liveatc.net, and there's a contact form to offer a feed and just fill out a few pieces of information there, and, and we'll uh, get back to you. All right. If anybody needs that link again, it's liveatc.net, and it'll also be in the show notes for this session at scannerschool.com. So, Dave, is there uh, anything else that you want to bring up today before we wrap up? So uh, we have, uh, in addition to being able to listen through the, the website, uh, which is free, uh, we have mobile apps that mm -hmm. are basically just a, a one-time charge. We don't charge you know, subscription fees or anything. We have those apps for iOS, Android, and Windows Phone. The other thing is we, we record everything that uh, goes through uh, all of the channels. So if uh, you want to pull up something that happened, uh, you know, that you maybe saw, you know, some, some thing, or, or there's pilots out there who want to be able to pull up uh, old recordings. You, those are available for up to 30 days right now. Uh, and then if you need something even older, you're researching some kind of aviation thing or something. Uh, we have them actually going back uh, a year uh, and we charge, you know, fees for that retrieval depending on what the request is. So that, you know, th those things, you could just contact us. Excellent. So again, Dave, I want to thank you very much for being uh, a guest on the podcast today. Where can somebody reach besides liveatc.net? Where can uh, somebody reach out to you if they need it, if they have any other questions for you? Uh, the website's the, the best and most direct way. It's easier to keep track of uh, all the communications that way. We also have uh, forums uh, where a lot of these things are discussed and aviation incidents, things like that. That's uh, forums.liveatc.net, and there's also a link off the website. Um, we have a Facebook page, which um, it's facebook.com slash liveatc, and uh, also on Twitter, at liveatc. Excellent. Excellent. Dave. Thank you so much for being a, uh, a part of the podcast, and thank you for teaching everybody that needs to know about, you know, introduction to aviation scanning. You did a much better job than I would have been able to do. Well, it's been, it's a pleasure. I, I really enjoy it, and uh, I've, I've enjoyed it for many years, and it, I'm just happy to spread the knowledge. So thank you for having me, Phil. That's what it's all about. Thank you so much, Dave. All right, I want to thank Dave Pasco, KM3T, from LiveATC.net for taking the time to introduce us or discuss in further depth or maybe just give you a little bit of a refresher on aviation monitoring and also about his website, liveatc.net. Now, again, you can find out more information on our show notes at scannerschool.com slash session 23. Uh, next week, we'll have Eric Carlson on from FlightAware. Now, uh, if you're not familiar with FlightAware, it's a flight tracking website, but they have a unique product that will allow you to track the flights for yourself. 
Uh, it's a really interesting device. I have one set up here. I was using it during the uh, the air show here. I posted a couple pictures of it on the Facebook group and also on our Twitter feed. So if you want to check that out, go to uh, scannerschool.com slash Twitter and scannerschool.com slash Facebook group. So again, Eric will be on next week. Really, really interesting device. And uh, we'll also talk about how planes communicate with each other and whatnot. So it's related to scanning, but it's um, another little uh, side aspect of the hobby. Now, again, before I get out of here for a final, I want to just thank again our Patreon supporter, Mark Bibby. Mark, thank you so much for being our first Patreon supporter. If anybody else wants to help support the Scanner School podcast and also our Facebook live sessions, you can do so by going to scannerschool.com slash support. So again, the session show notes are at scannerschool.com slash session 23, and you can help support the podcast by going to scannerschool.com slash support. All right, guys, we'll catch you all next week. 73, my name is Phil Lichtenberger, and thanks for joining us on the Scanner School podcast, where we teach you everything that you need to know about the scanner radio hobby. Thanks for listening to the Scanner School podcast. Be sure to visit www.scannerschool.com to access the show notes and bonus content.